Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Am I on? I, I think I'm on. All right. Well, it is just uh, awesome to be here. It's uh, just been a, a tremendous blessing. Uh, thank Andrew and the staff for the invitation. I got in at the tail end of last night and uh, just was fabulous to see that um, my good friend James Brown had been here last year, told me all about it and said, oh, you, you need to come. Can't, can't wait. It's going to be spectacular. So uh, I, I've really been looking forward to this. And I'll tell you, the hospitality has been tremendous, uh, taking good care of me, just like the video, all the snacks and everything you need. I didn't know I was supposed to pay for them. But... <laughs> Woke up this morning, breakfast, looking out at the, that scenery. You don't get that in Florida. Um, <laughs> So it has just been, been special and spectacular, and everything, everything has been great. But I do have one bone to pick with Andrew. His assistant, Donna, she set everything up for me, and, and I talked to her, and I told her, I've never been here before, so I just had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I said, how do you dress? And she said, oh, very, very casual. She said, if I know Andrew, he's going to be in cowboy boots and jeans. I said, wow, that's perfect. That's me, because uh, as a football coach, there's nothing I like better than a sweater and some tennis shoes. So that was perfect. And then uh, I said, well, when am I going to speak? And she said, well, we've got two segments, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And again, I said, that is, that is just perfect. Then I asked Donna, how long are my segments going to be? And when she said 50 minutes, I almost freaked out. <laughs> I said, 50 minutes? Are you kidding me? I'm a football coach, okay? Do you know who I'm used to speaking to? Okay? We have very short attention spans. So I really don't go long. And then like Ashley was saying on the video, we have a tight schedule, we gotta stay on, on track. So um, it, it's just, I'm not used to talking that long. Well, you know, football coaches were probably known for our motivational halftime speeches. But what you probably don't know is because of NFL scheduling and TV and James and his guys, our halftimes are only 12 minutes long, 12 minutes total now. So you have to take into account the fact that you have to walk in and walk out. And it's usually about a two minute walk each way. So now you're down to about eight minutes. Then, of course, you have to give the players a chance to change their equipment, see the trainer, and take care of any injuries. So now you're down to about six minutes. Then, of course, you've got to allow time for the most important thing. You've got to let the players go to the bathroom. <laughs> so maybe you have three or four minutes at halftime to really talk. And, of course, your coordinators, they've got to go over things and changes in strategy and what you're going to do different. And, strategy you're going to employ in the second half. So if you're lucky, you might have a minute and a half to two minutes to talk at halftime. So these great motivational speeches you've heard about, they, they might be overrated a little bit. <laughs> but the good thing is that we football coaches are used to being very brief and to the point. So you're lucky today. You're going to hear a brief to the point message. In fact, I can share with you the best halftime speech I ever gave. It was so short, I can give it to you verbatim today. And James Brown was a big, big part of it, actually. It was the 2006 AFC Championship game. We're playing the New England Patriots, playing them in Indianapolis, finally. They had beaten us two years in a row in New England, in the snow and in the cold. Well, now we had them at home where we wanted them, and there was no doubt in my mind we were going to take care of business that day and go to Super Bowl 41. Well, in the first half, we could not have played worse. Patriots jumped out. They got three quick touchdowns. We were struggling, couldn't get anything going, just a couple of field goals. So we're down 21-6 going into the locker room at halftime. And going into our tunnel, there's a big screen just like that. And we have the TV broadcast. And we were just getting ready to turn into the locker room and I, who do I see but James Brown on the CBS broadcast, and he's got a graphic on their halftime show. No team has ever come back from more than 10 points down in a championship game. You remember that? And I'm saying, why couldn't he have waited 30 more seconds until we got in the locker room to give us that great tidbit of information that he had dug out from the archives? 
Well, now I felt like I needed to really say something dramatic to get our team going because not only have we not played well, but now I just found out in order to win the game, we're going to have to do something nobody in history had done. So I needed a great halftime speech. Well, all this takes place. Players are going to the bathroom. They see the doctor, the change in equipment. And of course, now because we're behind, everybody else has something to say. The coordinators, they're drawing plays, what we're going to change, what we're going to do. Official knocks on the door, one minute till kickoff. And at that point, Peyton Manning got up and he wanted to say something. So I couldn't just say, well, no, you don't get to talk. <laughs> so I let him go. And now I can feel, I don't want to get a delay of game penalty to start the second half. I don't have very much time left. So I told the guys, I said, you know what? We played very poorly in the first half. And if we don't start playing better fast, we're going to lose. And the official knocked on the door and we had to go out for the second half. <laughs> so with that brilliant halftime speech, we executed the greatest comeback in the history of the NFL playoffs. So that is a true story, actually. But I'm only kidding about picking the bone with Andrew. I, I really uh, am just thrilled to be here. I'm always honored whenever I get a chance to speak, especially when I get a chance to talk about my faith. And since we won that Super Bowl in 2006, I've been asked to do this quite a bit. I've spoken to a lot of corporations about teamwork, about performance. I've spoken to young people about looking to their futures. And of course, I get asked a, a lot to speak to church groups, men's groups, uh, just about growing in your faith. And I love all those opportunities. But I can tell you, one of the biggest thrills I get is when I get the opportunity to speak to an athletic team before a game. When I played, I always loved those chapel services because they helped me keep things in perspective. And because of that, I get a special, special thrill when I get to do a chapel service. And probably my most memorable one that I've done was just over a year ago. I got to speak to the Clemson University football team when they were playing Alabama for the national championship. I always had a great admiration for Coach Sweeney, their coach, because he was a strong Christian. He did it the right way. He coached his players the way I always wanted to coach my players, to try to make them not just better players, but better young men. So I'd always wanted to do a chapel for Coach Sweeney, but timing just never worked out. Well, the championship game last year just happened to be in my hometown of Tampa, Florida. So when the Clemson chaplain called me and said, can you come speak to our guys before the game? I was pretty sure it could work out. Well, then when he told me they always gave the chapel speaker two tickets to the game, it was a no-brainer. I said, definitely, <laughs> I will be there and I'll be in the stands to watch that game. Uh, so I was really excited to do that, but immediately after I, I accepted, you start to think and, and question, what am I going to say? This is a big game, a national championship, maybe the biggest game many of these kids are going to play in their entire life. What would I talk to them about that would resonate with them four hours before such a big game? See, I'd been on, on their side of things many times. When you're a player, getting ready for a big game, you're thinking about so much stuff and it's going through your, your mind. It's tough to concentrate sometimes on that chapel service. How much will you really remember? And as a speaker, you want to always have people remember what you say. So that night, I didn't give them a lot to remember. I just asked them to remember one thought and three Bible verses. And I took my points from a chapel speaker that I had heard 39 years before that. And I thought to myself, it must be good stuff, because if I remembered it for 39 years, it had to be pretty good. Well, that date was January 21st, 1979. I was 22 years old. A uh, member of the Pittsburgh Steelers were in Miami getting ready to play the Cowboys in Super Bowl XIII. We were sitting in a meeting room at the Marriott Hotel in Miami listening to the last words we'd hear before we went over to the stadium. And that was definitely a big game, Super Bowl 13. There had been 12 Super Bowls before that. Green Bay won the first two, then Miami won two, Dallas had won two, and we had won two with the Steelers. So whoever won this game was going to be the first team to ever win three Super Bowls. They were going to make history. Well, the chapel speaker that day was a man named Doc Eshelman. He was the 
president, the head of Athletes in Action at the time, and I can still remember what he told us to this day. He said, this is Super Bowl 13, man. This is going to be the biggest game of your life. And do you know why it's so big? It's going to be big, not because it's the Super Bowl, not because it's for the NFL championship, not even because there are 100 million people that are going to be watching, not even because you're going to make history if you win the game. This is going to be the biggest game of your life because it's the one you're playing now. That's what makes it important. That's what makes it special. Because whatever God has you doing, whatever he allows you to do is huge. He cares about it or he wouldn't have you doing it. So this is a huge game that you'll be playing tonight. But, he went on, if you think this is the biggest game you'll ever play, or if you think it's the most important thing you'll ever do, you're wrong. The most important thing you'll ever do is what you do next. Now, I was tracking with him up to that point, but then I started thinking, mm, I don't know about that. Now, what could be bigger than the Super Bowl? But you know, over the years, I've come to realize he was right. In fact, I began to realize it right after the game. See, we beat the Cowboys that night, 35-31. It was probably the most, yes. Steeler fans, yeah. It was probably the most exciting Super Bowl played up to that point. It was our third win in five years, and, and we did feel like it was a special accomplishment. I was a backup player at the time, and uh, not one of those guys that the media wanted to talk to. So I was able to just sit in the locker room and soak it all in. And my locker happened to be in between, it was numerical, so I was in between Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris, two of our better players. So I was just sitting there watching the media ask these guys questions. I was amazed. You know one of the first questions they asked them after this big game? Do you think you guys can repeat next year? <laughs> and I said to myself, I scratched my head. I said, why are they asking that? Don't they understand we just made history? Don't they want to know how we beat the Cowboys? Don't they want to know how we feel? And yeah, they did want to know that, but what they really wanted to know was, what were we going to do next? Exactly what the chapel speaker said. Well, that's what I told those Clemson players last year. The same thing would happen to them. After the game that night, they'd get some questions. They'd get questions about how they felt and their emotions, if they won the game or if they were disappointed at the loss. But many of the media would want to know what they were going to do next, what was happening in their future. So I asked those players a question. I said, if this is a big game, but it's not the biggest thing you'll ever do, how should we approach it? And that's where the three scriptures come in. The first one is 1 Corinthians 9, 24, which says this, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. You know, our chaplain with the Steelers, Hollis Half, shared that scripture with me when I first got to the team. And it was uh, written by the Apostle Paul, as most of you know. But it was life-changing for me. Because for a long time as a Christian, I grew up thinking it was wrong to place an emphasis on winning. You know, we hear it all the time from our non-Christian friends. God doesn't care who wins a game. If there is a God, what would he care about some game? And then we hear it from our Christian friends. It doesn't really matter if you win. God just wants you to do your best. <laughs> well, here, the Bible was saying, no, th that's not exactly true. That's not exactly right. Paul was saying, yes, be competitive. Run to win. Don't apologize for striving to be the best. So I told those Clemson players that. I told them, in fact, God expects it from you. He expected them to train hard in the offseason. He expected them to practice well. He expected them to spend extra time watching film. And he was going to expect them to give 110% that night during the game. That's important to the Lord. Paul says, run to win. And when I played for the Steelers, we had a lot of guys who lived by that verse. They put a tremendous amount of effort and energy into being the best, and we were the best. 
We ended up winning that Super Bowl. We won another Super Bowl the next year. We won four in a six year period of time. And there are many people would say that was the best football team ever. And I wouldn't disagree with them. <laughs> but what most people don't know is that team was fueled by a lot of very strong Christian men. Joe Green, John Stallworth, Terry Bradshaw, Donnie Shell, John Kolb, Larry Brown, Mel Blunt, they were my teammates, but strong, strong Christian men. And they epitomized 1 Corinthians 9, 24. They played to win. They were dedicated to their craft. They practiced hard every single day because they wanted to win. But even more than that, they really believed God expected them to be their very best every single time they went on the field whether it was a Super Bowl game or simply a Friday practice. Their responsibility to God was to give him everything they had, give him their best every time they stepped on the field. And that was a big reason why we were so good and why we were so consistent over a long period of time. But the Christian players on that team knew something else. They knew the next verse, verse 25, where Paul says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So what does that mean? Every athlete, every football player works hard. Everybody lifts weights. Everybody runs gassers. Everybody practices hard. And my teammates with the Steelers, we were prepared to outwork everybody in the NFL. Why? Because we wanted to win. We wanted to be the best. But here was Paul saying that prize is going to fade away. It's temporary. And after a while, it won't seem so special. And you know what? Paul was absolutely right. That's what our chapel speaker in Super Bowl 13 was talking about. Yes, it's a big game, but not for long. The glory won't last because you'll always have another game coming up. And your next game is going to be more important than your last game. And Doc Eshelman was right that night. The glory didn't last long because once we got back home to Pittsburgh, we had to start preparing for the next season. We were the champions now. People were going to come after us. They were going to be looking to knock us off. So nothing was permanent. And you know, we got $32,000 for winning that Super Bowl game. I was 22 years old. I had never seen that much money in my life. But you know what? It's all gone now. <laughs> spent. And today I couldn't even tell you what I, the one thing I spent that money on. I just know it's not here. <laughs> all the mementos, they're great. They're in a scrapbook and I love going back looking at them, showing them to my kids. But it's not the same as being out there and playing. And even the ring, the ring, when we got it, it was awesome. It was spectacular. I wore it probably six days in a row, showed it to everybody. Hey, I'm going over there. <laughs> and I might meet you over there. And it was awesome. But you know what? Today, compared to the rings they're getting now, it looks like a toy. It's not like my wedding ring. I, I very seldom wear my Super Bowl rings. My wedding ring I wear every day because this means something. Okay? This means something. No, even the notoriety doesn't last. I get stopped all the time. I got stopped in the, in the uh, Colorado Springs airport last night. Guy came up to me and I'm flattered when they stop me. Hey, I recognize your voice. Aren't you, you're, you work for ESPN, right? So I have to say, no, NBC. You know? And then someone might say, and, and you used to be a coach. And it's funny because the kids, they say, Coach, I didn't know you coached. I thought you just were on TV talking about the games. And if somebody ever says, well, didn't you used to play for the Steelers? Then the kids say, oh, no way. No, you didn't play. You couldn't have played. And I have to say, yeah, I, I did play back in the day. But that's our society. It's the latest and greatest, and, and it doesn't last. It doesn't last. Think about it. Think about it. I ask you a question. Who won the Super Bowl five years ago? Okay. Unless it was your favorite team, 2013, unless it was your favorite team, you probably have to Google it. 
because we talk more about who's going to win next year than we talk about who won five years ago. So if a Super Bowl isn't long lasting, then what is? Well, Paul said it. Paul had, had the key, the eternal prize. He was talking about eternal life, hanging out with the Lord forever in heaven. He said, that's what's going to last. I told those Clemson players that night, this is what Paul was saying in those two verses. Think about how much you guys have put into this season. Go back to spring practice, your summer workouts, training camp, regular season, all the work you've done. If winning on the field is important, and if you put that much into it, and this prize is gonna fade away very quickly, how much more should you put into your spiritual training? And that always hits home with me when I talk to athletes, especially to college athletes. Not many people work harder at their craft trying to make their dreams come true than college athletes. Not many people sacrifice more. Athletes know how to train, but the key is, are they training with the proper focus? Are they training and shooting for goals that are really the most important ones? I ask that question a lot of college players because I can relate to that. I was right there with them uh, when I was in school. I don't have many regrets about my life or my career because I was extremely blessed, but I do have one regret, and that is I didn't train as well spiritually when I was in college. I was 17 years old when I went to the University of Minnesota, and I had three goals of Minnesota, man. I had three goals when I was a freshman. I wanted to play football and basketball. I wanted to lead our team to a Big Ten championship and I wanted to graduate in four years. Those were my goals. I actually achieved that number one goal. I played two sports, although I only played basketball for one year. I didn't achieve goal number two. Uh, we finished third few times in the Big Ten, but we could never beat Michigan and Ohio State when I was there. Yes. And I didn't quite achieve goal number three. I was on track to graduate in four years, but uh, after my senior football season, I got invited to play in three All-Star games in, in San Francisco, the Hula Bowl in, in Hawaii, and the Japan Bowl in Tokyo. So I accepted those invitations, and I basically missed the winter quarter. Um, so I didn't get to graduate in that spring, but it was a decision I didn't regret because I got the chance to do some great things. And those goals I had in college were very good. They kept me on track athletically, they kept me on track academically, and uh, I, I did great during my college career. But the problem was those goals didn't help me at all spiritually. I was growing as an athlete, I was growing as a student, I was even growing socially as a person but I wasn't growing spiritually, and I didn't even realize it at the time. In fact, I didn't understand it until I went to my first pro training camp the next year with the Steelers. I got there to Pittsburgh, and in the very first meeting, I'm sitting in the front row taking notes with my notepad out, just like my mom always told me to do, and Coach Noel, in his opening talk, said something I'll never forget. He said, gentlemen, welcome to the National Football League. You're now getting paid to play football, so that makes it your profession. But don't make football your life. If you make football your life, you're gonna leave the game disappointed. And I was writing this down, and I got to that. Don't make football your life. I had to stop, because up to that point, I had made football my life. And here was a man who had won these Super Bowls, and he was gonna tell me about what was important, and he says, don't make football your life. Well, Coach Noel did one other very, very important thing for me, that training camp, that changed my life around. He assigned me a roommate by the name of Donnie Shell. Donnie was the best example of a Christian athlete I had ever been around. But not only was he a Christian athlete, he was a Christian everything. Christian husband, Christian father, Christian roommate, Christian teammate, everything he did, he put Christ first. And it was important for me to be in there with him. And the, the Lord did it, and no, no question in my mind about it. The first thing Donnie did was invite me to the team Bible study. He said, I needed to start reading my word more. He said, you know what? He said, I always see in your playbook, where's your Bible? 
said, wow. I said, well, I'm trying to learn what to do. He said, you better learn what really to do. (laughs) And that was so instructive for me because I was able to see firsthand what Coach Noel was talking about when he said, don't make football your life. I was able to see in Donnie someone who had things in the right perspective. And that brings me to the last verse I quoted to those Clemson players. My mom's favorite verse and one she used to quote to me over and over and over when I was growing up. Matthew 16, 26. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world but forfeited his soul? Well, unfortunately, in my 31 years in professional football, I saw that happen many, many times. The men who didn't heed Coach Knowles' warning. Men who got every worldly honor you could imagine, money, fame, notoriety, Super Bowls, but they forfeited their souls with bad choices, and not following God's commands. And whenever I saw that happening, it was, it was terrible to see. And many times it was very, very unexpected. One of the most visible examples of that was a young man named Michael Vick. Okay, many of you know the story. In 2007, Michael was the most, uh, the highest paid player in the NFL 10 years ago. He was also making tens of millions of dollars in endorsements from Nike and Gatorade. But as you might remember, during that off season, it was uncovered that Michael was involved in a dog fighting ring. And he spent the next 21 months in federal prison. In the spring of 2009, as he was about to be released, I went to Leavenworth to visit him. And I asked him, what happened? How how could this happen? How could you go from the highest paid player in football to Leavenworth Prison? And he told me something very interesting. He said, Coach, I was raised right. I knew who God is, and I prayed a lot, prayed often. I asked God to allow me to get to the National Football League. But in 2001, when I got drafted number one in the whole league, I felt the Lord had answered my prayers, and I didn't need God anymore. He said, at that point, I started making some poor choices, friends, made some poor choices of activities, and his football career came to a crashing end. But you know what? That conviction and that prison sentence were actually a blessing for Mike. I know I was a little skeptical when I went to see him. I, I didn't know where his heart was, but my impression changed when I asked him one question. I said, Michael, what, what's been the toughest part of these 21 months being in prison? And he told me there were actually two tough things. He said, first of all, we only get 10 minutes a day on the telephone. So trying to split up 10 minutes between my wife, my three kids, and my mother, that's hard to do. But it made him realize how important family and how important relationships were. But he told me the absolute toughest thing for him was answering his mail. See, he'd get letters from little boys like this. Dear Michael Vick, you're my favorite football player. My mom got me a Mike Vick jersey, number seven, for my birthday, and I wear it all the time. Why aren't you playing anymore? And he told me he would write every one of those boys back and say, I'm not playing because I messed up. I made some bad choices about who I hung around with and the activities I got involved in. I did it to myself. And When he told me how difficult it was for him to write those letters, but he wrote every single young man back, I realized he truly did understand and he did want to change. Well, prison gave Mike a chance to reassess his life and to change course. He asked the Lord to help him get back on track, and God did that. Later that spring, the Philadelphia Eagles and uh, their head coach at the time, Andy Reid, took a chance, and they signed Michael to a contract against a lot of heat. (coughs) But Andy Reid believed in second chances. And over the next couple of years, Michael demonstrated that he had changed. He not only did some awesome community service work in the Philadelphia area, but in 2010, he won the NFL's Comeback Player of the Year Award. Today, I'm very proud of Mike and and what he's done with his second chance, but I can tell you, he really is the exception to the rule of Matthew 16, 26 
because we can't always count on getting a second chance. So I finished my talk with those Clemson players that afternoon by telling them that I wanted them to really understand what was at stake for them that night as they were going out to play. They were gonna have a chance to do something special, something that not many people get to do on the field. They were gonna get a chance to win a national championship. But if that's all they did, if all they did was win a game, it really wouldn't be that significant. The glory would pass away pretty soon, just as all temporary things do. I wanted them to make sure that they had that eternal prize covered as well, because that's the most important prize we can win. Well, I'm happy to say that Clemson did win the game that night. They upset Alabama and won the national championship. And it was a great win for their team, it was a great win for their school, but it was even more awesome to see their head coach and many of their players get up after the game and talk about how their real goal was not just to win a national championship, but to give glory to God. And one of the highlights to me in that game was when the TV broadcast zoomed in for a close-up on one of the Clemson defensive players, and he had taped on his arm on tape, I am running to win. And I realized that most of the country, most of the people watching TV would have no idea what that meant on that piece of tape, but I knew that my message had gotten through to at least one player that night. So why do I tell you this story? What does it mean to us over a year later? Well, I, I think it means quite a bit because I believe Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and when he wrote it, he wasn't just thinking about athletes. No, he was referring to everything we do. Are we running to win in our jobs? Are we doing the very best we can at work because that will honor God, not just in order to make money? Are we running to win in our relationships? Are we trying to be the best friends we can be, not for what we'll get out of it, but so we can honor the Lord, and that's what he wants us to do. Are we running to win with our families? Are we running to win with our finances? You know, I believe we should strive to be excellent in everything we do. We want to represent God well. We want to fully utilize the gifts he's given us in everything. Because I believe God does care who wins Super Bowls. God does care about whether you get that big sale or not. God does care about whether the company hits its projected numbers. He really does care about all those things. They're just not the most important thing to him. And we don't want to just win in areas that aren't going to be long lasting. We want to win in the most important area of life. We want to win for eternity. As Andrew said last night, if you're born again, you have everything you need right inside of you to run to win. All we have to do is let the Holy Spirit to direct us. And that's what this is all about, winning from within. I want to show you a picture, and I think we can pull it up, of some guys you may have heard of who understand that principle. Uh, I got a chance to be, visit the Philadelphia Eagles locker room after the Super Bowl. Okay. I got a chance to take my 11-year-old son in there. And I don't know if we can pull up the picture. There it is. And I'll tell you who that is. From left to right, that's uh, Carson Wentz on the left, who was injured. Okay. Zach Ertz, who caught the winning touchdown pass. Nick Foles, who took uh, Carson Wentz's place midway through the season. And Nate Sudfeld, the backup quarterback, the third team quarterback. So three quarterbacks and the guy who caught the winning touchdown pass. This is right after the game. They're not in the regular locker room. You know where those guys were? They were in a room by themselves, praying, thanking the Lord. And you know what they were thanking the Lord for? Not the fact that they won the game, but they were thanking the Lord that they got the opportunity to talk about Jesus after the game when people asked them how they did it. So to be able to show my 11-year-old son that and take him in there and say, this is what's really important. This is, these guys understand 
what's really important in life, and they're running to win, not just win Super Bowls, but win in life and win for eternity. Justin, that's what life is all about. And that was a special, special moment for me because those guys understood the principle. After our break, you're gonna hear from one of the best examples that I've ever seen in understanding that principle of running to win, but running for the right reasons. And that's James Brown. And I'm gonna take a moment now to brag about James, because he won't talk about himself, and he's too humble to give you the whole story. So I'm gonna give you, as Paul Harvey would say, the untold story. <laughs> JB has not only been a great friend to me, but he's been a tremendous, tremendous role model. He's taken these principles we've just talked about, and he's walked them out in his daily life. He's excelled in the eyes of the world and gotten to the very top of his profession without ever once compromising his Christian values. And yeah, that deserves an applause. And I can tell you from experience, if you think it's tough being a Christian in professional football, you should try it in TV. <laughs> the TV business, there's more craziness to navigate in television. Egos, petty jealousy, self-promotion, way more than you'd ever see in football. And James has made it to the very top by doing it the Lord's way, by always focusing on others, by being humble, by making his teammates look their best. And I, I can't tell you how rare that is in our business. I admire James. But even more than that, I admire how he always, always, always keeps Christ first in everything he does. When I retired from the NFL in 2008, NBC approached me about coming to work for them. And I, I uh, immediately called JB because I had some concerns. And my biggest concern was uh, the fact that one of the reasons I was retiring, I wanted to get back into a regular routine in church. When I coached, that routine always got upset in the fall. So from the end of July to the beginning of January, we couldn't really go to church uh, with the family on Sundays. And I, I wanted to get back to that. And I felt like, boy, if I take this television broadcasting job, I'm really just setting myself up to get back in the same routine. And James told me how he did it and how he approached his schedule in the fall, that he always made sure that Wednesday was his kind of special day that he didn't let anything get in the way and he used Wednesday night service kind of like his Sundays. And then he told me that they always had a pre-broadcast Bible study in his hotel uh, before the, that he would go over to, to broadcast on the weekends. Well, that made sense to me and that was one of the big reasons I ended up taking the job with NBC. Well, when I started with NBC in New York in 2009, amazingly, or, or maybe I guess I should say miraculously, NBC put us in the same hotel with CBS with James and his guys. How does the Lord work that out? You know? So JB invited me. That is... You know what, that says timer done, but that is not <laughs> my, that is my, that, I think that's Ashley keeping us on track, but no. <laughs> so 2009, I'm in the London Hotel, JB invites me to come up to one of these, uh, Bible studies. I opened the door, I was amazed. I couldn't believe all the people who were there, all the people from the hotel who had committed to take their break at that very specific time to be part of this Bible study. There were bellmen in there, maintenance people, room service people, front desk staff. In fact, I'm not sure how the hotel functioned for that half hour <laughs> because half the staff was in JB's room. But it was an awesome time, and every week, it was something that JB kept as a priority in his routine. About a year later, one of the bellmen commented that, you know, it's a shame 
we can only do this during the season. We only meet during the football seasons. Too bad we can't keep this going. So we decided, JB, Mike Hines, the Bellman, and I, we decided that we'd do a three-way phone call in the winter and continue to explore God's word. Well, that three-way call soon turned into a five-person conference call, and then eight, and then 10. And now, seven years later, we have almost 50 people on a phone Bible study call every Wednesday. So when I think of James Brown, I don't think of the man who is an Emmy-winning broadcaster. I think of the guy who would do a three-way phone call with a bellman to help him grow in his faith. That's running to win. That's understanding what life is all about and understand that it won't benefit us anything to gain the whole world if we forfeit our soul. And that is having a right relationship with God. So I'm very, very appreciative of my friendship with James because he's been such a great example to me of running the spiritual race the right way, running the spiritual race to win. And believe me, that's the most important race we will ever run. So I'd like to close my time right now with just a little prayer for all of us in the room that we can understand what's important in life, but more than that, understand what Andrew said last night, that we have everything we need right here to run that spiritual race well, to run to win and run effectively for the Lord. So would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, I thank you for all, this men, all these men in this room who would make a commitment to come here and to grow and to, to want to learn about you and, and get that deeper relationship. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us and nurtures us and, and directs us. And uh, I just pray that every one of us can not only understand what's important, uh, but we can apply it, Lord, as we go out from here to our jobs, our school, our families, uh, to know that we want to be the very best in everything you would have us do. But to understand that the things in life that we might think are important are not the most important things to you, but it's relationship with you, it's serving other people, it's helping people grow, and more than anything, directing people to your son, Jesus Christ. Let that be the important thing in our life. Let us run that race to win. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much.